thank you for joining me here on Think Tech Hawaii. My name is DeSoto Brown, and this is my program, which is called How Did We Get Here, which is a look back at stories of Hawaii's past. I am the Bishop Museum historian. I'm also the curator for the archives department at Bishop Museum. And the pictures that I'm going to be showing you today mostly come from the Bishop Museum archives collection, but some of them are from my personal collection as well. And as you can see by the slide that's on the screen right now, the subject today is Waikiki. And specifically, the title of this episode is The Destruction of Waikiki, Past and Future. And that may seem a little bit strange sounding, but I'll explain it as we go along. Why is Waikiki important? Waikiki is crucial to our economy. Our economy depends upon tourism, as I'm sure everybody knows. And Waikiki is the center of tourism in the Hawaiian Islands. That is why what happens to Waikiki is going to affect all of us. That's why we have to be concerned about Waikiki in the future. And it's also very good for us to know Waikiki's past and how it was turned into the densely populated urban area that it is today. In fact, Waikiki could be considered a city within the city of Honolulu. And let's go back in time and see what happened to Waikiki and why I'm saying it was destroyed. Waikiki developed naturally in the natural environment as an area of wetlands. This photograph from the early 1900s clearly shows you what I am talking about. Much of Waikiki was in fact covered by fresh water. Why? Because the Ko'olau Mountains, which are to the left of this picture, outside of the picture, are rained upon regularly a great deal just because the trade winds push moisture laden air up against the mountains and that condenses into rain and it falls. And that fresh water first runs downhill from the Ko'olau Mountains as streams into what is now Waikiki. And they used to, those streams used to run all the way out to the shoreline. Secondly, the water that falls, the rain that falls on the Ko'olau Mountains percolates down through the rock and it too comes up at Waikiki in the form of springs. And the word, the Hawaiian word, Waikiki, means spouting fresh water, meaning a reference to the springs that came up out of the ground there. This was a large area of natural wetlands. And for Hawaiians, this meant that Waikiki was an area of abundance. It was a major food production site. And that's because the main food that was eaten by Hawaiians in traditional Hawaiian culture was kalo or taro. And in this picture, you can see the distinctive large leaves of the kalo plant growing in flooded fields in what was then the continuation of Waikiki all the way up into what we now call Mo'ili'ili. There were wetlands in that entire area. Kalo is, as I said, a major source of food, what well, was a major source of food for Hawaiians, but it is grown throughout the Pacific. It's a plant that originated in Asia. And as people, moved through the Pacific and gradually populated the different Pacific islands over many centuries, and that includes the Hawaiians, they took this plant with them for them to use as, again, the foundation of their source of food. And the Kalo plant, which you see in the picture on the left, is entirely edible. You can eat the leaves, you can eat the stems, and of course the roots are the main source of food because that is what poi is made from. But kalo, interestingly, is not edible unless it is cooked the proper way. It contains crystals in all parts of the plant that are actually dangerous because they irritate your mouth and your throat so much. They can only be gotten rid of 
if you cook the plant enough, and this is something that uh, human beings figured out over who knows how many times people tried to, to eat this before they figured out the way to do it. And it's one of the things that we can uh, be amazed that our ancestors figured out, not only here in the Hawaiian Islands, but all over the world. In any case, you can see in the picture on the right, a field of kalo and the person standing there is planting and or harvesting the kalo, which is not an easy process because it's gotta be buried in the mud of the water. And then it's got to later be cultivate. I mean, you've got to cultivate it, you've got to weed it, you have to make sure it's growing well. Then you have to pull it up. This was a difficult process. People today who do it will tell you it's a difficult process. I've never done it and I don't want to do it. But this is why Waikiki was so important because it was a major source of kalo as food. As the 19th century progressed, the Hawaiian population began to dwindle. And that was mostly because diseases had been accidentally introduced from the outside world. And as the Hawaiian population shrank, more people not only moved to the Hawaiian Islands, but many were brought here as immigrants to work in the growing sugar industry. And many of them were from China and Japan. And as those people left their sugar plantation jobs when their contracts expired, they moved out into all different types of work in the larger community. And many of them moved to Waikiki where the kalo fields were not being used as much. And instead they began to plant rice. So Japanese and Chinese farmers in the late 1800s switched Waikiki from kalo to rice. And in this picture, you also see that ducks were raised there in very large numbers, mostly by Chinese farmers. Ducks, of course, live around water. So the flooded wetlands of Waikiki were also where you could raise ducks, not only for duck eggs, but for ducks themselves to be another source of food. And not only ducks and rice and kalo, but in this picture, you can see that banana plants are being grown on the raised areas of dry land in what is the, again, the wetlands of Waikiki. And in the center of the picture, you can see, see three coconut palms. There was also a very historic large coconut palm grove in Waikiki. And again, coconuts, uh, coconut trees produce coconuts. That's another source of food. I also want to point out in the background of this picture in the distance, you can see the Ko'olau Mountains, and that's where the rain is falling, and that's the source of the fresh water that covers Waikiki in this time period. That was all going to change dramatically, and that was going to lead to the first round of destruction of Waikiki. This picture is of the Moana Hotel, which opened in 1901 in Waikiki. And this is the original Moana Hotel, which is a wooden building. It was later enlarged to have two concrete wings on either side. And that's the Moana Hotel, which is still standing today. Why was the Moana important? Well, first, it was a symbol of how tourism was growing. And tourism was growing because of the use of steamships and steamship companies were bringing more and more people here, including for vacations. The Moana was not the first hotel in Waikiki, but it was the first large hotel in Waikiki. This was a huge building at the time that it was built. The Moana was a first class hotel. That meant that it had electricity. That meant that each room had its own bathroom. That meant that each room had its own telephone. This was a very modern and very forward structure for its time. But why was it so important? Well, because it was the first sign that Waikiki was going to be developed into the tourist area that it is today. And this photograph shows you the Moana Hotel on the left with the beach at Waikiki in front of it and Diamond Head in the distance. And because of the success of the Moana and because of the success of it making Waikiki a tourist destination, 
that was going to lead economically for people to want to develop Waikiki because there was money to be made there, not only for hotels, but for housing. Here is a fascinating picture. This is one of the very first aerial pictures taken of Waikiki, and it dates from 1920 to 1921. And on the far left of the photo, you can see the Moana Hotel on the Waikiki shoreline. And you can also see the shoreline has a number of buildings on it. You can also see there's very little sand, and that's something I'm going to talk about in just a minute. But inland, behind these structures along the beach, that's the important part. Those are the agricultural fields that I've just been showing you pictures of. Those are the flooded fields used for kalo, used for rice. But why is that uh, relevant? Well, it's relevant because for people who wanted to develop Waikiki, who saw there was an economic possibility of making money, all of this flooded land, all of these agricultural areas were an impediment to being able to develop Waikiki. And so in an interesting development, and I cannot say what level of collusion there might have been, but the territory of Hawaii, the predecessor of the state of Hawaii in 1906 produced a report from the Department of Health stating that Waikiki was the potential source of diseases that could turn into epidemics or plagues, if you will. Now, it's true that the wetlands of Waikiki did smell earthy. They did smell organic because there was a lot of stuff going on there that was growing and dying and uh, that was decomposing. So that smell was used as an excuse for the indication of the presence of disease. There was no disease threat really from Waikiki to any extent. There were no mosquito-borne diseases that could have originated there. And yet, this was used, this report, as a justification for the dredging and the landfill of Waikiki that followed. And this is a dredge owned by the Hawaiian Dredging Company, uh, which was owned by Walter Dillingham, a very important and very influential and very wealthy man, businessman. And Hawaiian Dredging got the contract to do this work. Well, the, quote, solution to the Waikiki problem was to dredge the Alawai Canal. And that's what you see going on in this picture, which was taken in 1924. The Alawai Canal did two things. One, it intercepted the streams that flowed from the Ko'olau Mountains to the beach and it cut them off so that they did not flow out to the beach anymore, but just exited and entered the, the water that was now going to be uh, going into the ocean at just one location through the Alawai Canal. And two, as the canal was dug, the material that was dug up provided the landfill that would fill in all of those waterways. And Waikiki had formed in its present in its present configuration, you could say, over many, many hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years, during which time the flat area, which had been probably developed through sediment being deposited from erosion from the Ko'olau Mountains, was also flooded and dried out repeatedly as the ocean level of the earth changed. So when the ocean levels were higher and this area was under ocean water, coral reefs had grown. And when the ocean level dropped, the coral died as it was exposed to the air. So Waikiki was composed of ancient coral beds. That's what this dredge is digging up with a shovel. And as it digs up that ancient coral and it turns it into small chunks, that material is pumped with water through large pipes, which you can see on the back of the dredge. And those large pipes could be moved around to wherever they were needed for all of that liquid and coral to be pumped and then expelled from the pipe into what had been wetlands. And this photo 
shows the pipe disgorging all of that coral mixed with brackish water into what had been Apua Kehau stream, which was one of the natural streams that had flowed to the ocean. And if you look carefully in the background at the upper left, you can see the roof of the Moana Hotel. The Moana was originally built on the shore or the banks of Apua Kehau stream, which is now completely gone. You have no idea that it was ever even there. And as all this landfill is being dumped, everything that's growing there, everything in the natural environment, any plants that were there, any water animals, whatever organisms were there, they're all being killed. They're all being wiped out. And at the time, that was not a source of anybody caring. That's just something that was considered collateral damage. The width of the Alawai Canal was specifically calculated so that enough material would be dug up to provide the landfill to make all of Waikiki dry land. And here's a picture of the result of what happened. This picture probably dates from about 1930. And although it's difficult to see, on the far left of the picture is the water of the Alawai Canal. In the center, obviously, is Alawai Boulevard, lined with these impressive looking streetlights. There's no traffic yet because not a lot of people live in Waikiki at this point, but on either side of Alawai Boulevard, you can see that white coral landfill that had been dug up out of the Alawai Canal. And when all that dry land was complete and in place, the original intention was for it to be developed as a suburb with single family homes. And this is what Waikiki was turned into starting in the 1920s. These two pictures show you what I'm talking about. The pieces of property that were offered for sale to individual buyers, and let me point out that all of the land owners that had owned land in this area had it condemned by the government so that it could then be resold to private buyers. And the properties were small. They were intended for small structures. And so one and two story buildings were built throughout Waikiki. Many of them were private homes on small parcels of land, but many others were what we would call today short term rental or transient housing because they could be rented for short times or they were rooming houses or small hotels where people could rent rooms. Well, Waikiki continued like this for some decades, but then in the 1960s came the second mass of destructive activities. This is an aerial photograph from about 1968. And again, look carefully in the bottom left corner, that's the Alawai Canal. Next to it is Alawai Boulevard. And then diagonally through the center of the picture is Kuhio Avenue. What's happening here is that Waikiki is growing explosively. That's because tourism in the 1960s began to grow explosively because jet airplanes came into use and that really kicked up the numbers of tourists coming. So the low level one and two story buildings that you can see many of in this picture are now being demolished and replaced by high rises that you can also see growing in this picture. And again, this is the second round of destruction that Waikiki is going through after its first level of destruction to turn it into dry land. Now, one thing that's very important in the history of Waikiki is the beach, because going to the beach is why most tourists want to stay in Waikiki. There's a lot of other stuff going on there, but a lot of people want to go lie in the sand and go in the ocean. Well, there never been a lot of sand in Waikiki in the modern time period, but if you look at this picture, which is from the 1870s, there's a lot of sand in the foreground. Waikiki did have a lot of sandy beach. And you will read people's writings today that claim that 
there was never a beach in Waikiki. It's all fake. It's all sand that's been imported. That's not true. There was sand. There was an abundance of sand. But what happened to it? Well, this picture from 1953 again shows you the Waikiki configuration that was created by the construction of the Alawai Canal, which you see on the left. You also see how it intercepts Palolo Stream on the left. But you also see that along the coastline, and that's the point of why I'm showing you this, all kinds of construction has occurred, which is going to have diminished the amount of sand. First of all, Waikiki sand was in fact mined occasionally to dig up sand to use for construction, this being in the late 1800s and early 1900s. But also sand, the sand of a beach is dynamic. It's always moving because the water is always moving it around. It migrates, it goes offshore, it comes back onshore, it moves along the shore. Well, all of this construction that you see here has interrupted the natural movement of sand. It can't do what it was normally going to do beforehand. There were large amounts of dredging offshore, particularly off of Fort Derussi, which is right in the center of Waikiki, that again, diminishes what the sand can do. So sand that is placed on the shoreline to keep a beach there will wash away because that's what happens in the natural world because it can no longer replenish itself the way it formerly did before humans interrupted it. Waikiki was also a place, not only because it had sand and also because it uh, was abundant for and fertile for growing crops, but it was also a place for recreation and relaxation. And in the 19th century, a succession of Hawaiian ali'i, Hawaiian nobility, owned property in Waikiki on which they constructed essentially vacant house, vacation houses. And here's a picture from that time period in the 1800s. We are looking at first a Puakehau stream in the foreground, which I showed you being filled in in the 1920s. But this property with this ancient coconut grove was where essentially pretty much the Royal Hawaiian Hotel is today. And this property, as well as other properties, were owned, as I said, by various Hawaiian ali'i into the 20th century. But it was not just ali'i who found Waikiki a pleasant place to live, either full time or as a vacation spot, if you had another home in Honolulu because you were wealthy. So all of the shoreline of Waikiki was built up, not all of it, but a great deal of it was built up by the early 1900s with private homes. And this picture, which is probably from about 1910, shows you, first of all, that there are homes right on the beach. They are right on the sand. They're right next to the water. Not only are they there, but there also are concrete walls like the one that you see in the foreground here. This is along Kalakaua Avenue, about where the intersection with Kapahulu Avenue is. And when you build concrete walls, you again interrupt the movement of sand. So by building all of these things right up next to the ocean, people unintentionally destroyed the beach. They built on the beach, and then what was left tended to wash away. That's why Waikiki doesn't have much sand. Had anybody been able to think of this 150 years ago and not built right on the beach, we'd still have a good sized beach, but we don't. And unfortunately, because of all those private homes being built right up next to the ocean, as those pieces of property were developed into large hotels, the hotels were built right up next to the ocean as well, on the sites of what had been private homes. So this postcard from the 1990s shows you how many huge Waikiki hotels are right up next to the water. And this is a problem. We're gonna end by looking at one of these hotels, the Reef Hotel, which was built in 1955, which is a very good example of what destruction 
we can anticipate for the future in Waikiki. This postcard dates probably from about 1960, and while it has been altered, it was retouched, and it's, it's a combination, it's a montage of different pictures to create a more romantic and attractive view of the hotel, so it's not really real. But what it shows you very clearly is there's a nice big beach in front of the Reef Hotel. And there it is with people lounging on it and enjoying it. Well, here's what it looked like then. And here's what the same beach looks like now. This is a picture I took in 2022. The beach is gone. The beach has washed away. The three stumps of the coconut trees in the foreground show you that they have died because there's no sand around them anymore. And they're now immersed in salt water. The water literally comes up to the foundation of the Reef Hotel. And anybody trying to walk along the beach finds themselves walking in the water and climbing over that concrete wall that you see in sort of the middle distance. And that's what those people are doing that you can see in this picture. This is what Waikiki is going to continue to face. This is the destruction that Waikiki is going to face as ocean levels rise and the ocean encroaches more and more onto all of the stuff that we have built. And I mentioned at the beginning, Waikiki is the foundation of our entire economy in the Hawaiian Islands. We cannot afford to have it be destroyed completely. We can't just walk away from it. The Reef Hotel was built and designed in a very innovative way by Roy Kelly, who was the man who built it and who developed the Outrigger Hotel chain, which was once very, very powerful and prominent in Waikiki. And he did this by, one, building two levels to the foundation. So if you were driving up to the hotel to drop somebody off, you in the picture on the left, you can see you drive up a ramp to get to that main level of the hotel. And this is still true today. But underneath that level was a lower level that was below grade. It's below street level. And at that lower level, there was that kooky looking round ramp that you see on the right. In this picture, looking down, and again, these are both from the middle 1950s, about when the hotel opened, you can see there are three levels. In the picture on the right, you can see corners of a second level. Then you see the main level on which uh, the lobby was, and most people would check in. But then down below that level is where you could be driven in, in, say, a bus. You'd get out underneath the main level, and you would walk up this round circular ramp to get up to the main level. And this photograph doesn't look like much because it's not in focus, but it's an illustration of a very, very important thing. You can see, again, this is the Reef Hotel, 1955. On the left is the ramp you take to get up to the main level, but in the center, we're looking down a ramp that goes to that below grade level. And in the center of that black rectangular opening to the parking level, you can see some illuminated stuff in the distance. That is the base of that circular ramp I just showed you. Why is this important? It's important because as ocean levels rise, all of the hotels in Waikiki that have below grade levels like this for parking, for maintenance, for things like the machinery to run their elevators, this is in danger of getting flooded as water levels goes up, go up. And the reason is that as ocean levels rise, they also cause underground water levels to rise. So there's a layer of fresh water underground under Waikiki. That, all that water that I showed you earlier, it's still there, but it's just covered up. As the ocean levels go up, that fresh water level goes up. And gradually things that are below grade are going to start to flood from that water. And in this particular picture, when the, the hotel opened in 1955, but on March 5th, 1958, 
Honolulu underwent its heaviest recorded rainfall in history. It rained at least 16 inches in 24 hours in the city of Honolulu. And this lower level parking was flooded to a depth of several feet that not only flooded all of the cars that were parked there, it inundated the coffee shop, which was located down there, and it ruined and flooded everything there. Well, that's a one-time natural disaster, but we can see that happening as well for a tsunami, and we can see it happening as well if a hurricane comes ashore from the south and pushes the storm surge ahead of it. Many hotels in Waikiki, as I said, now have these lower levels. This is going to be what floods first. This is what is going to, where we're first going to see the future destruction that natural forces are going to bring to Waikiki. How are we going to deal with that? Well, greater minds than mine are putting themselves to work to think about how we're going to deal with this. And a number of different things are being proposed. And I don't have the time to even get into what those are. But I just want to end by saying, keep in mind, this is destruction of the future that we have to cope with. Thank you all very much for joining me. I'm DeSoto Brown. You've been watching How Did We Get Here, my program here on Think Tech Hawaii. I hope this has given you a lot to think about and a lot to be aware of that you might not have already known. And I look forward to doing more of these programs that I hope you'll be watching in the future. And so till I see you again, everyone, aloha. <laughs>